Well, we're so glad you could make it. Maybe you remember a fun film in 1998 from Disney. It was called A Bug's Life. You remember that film? It was uh, featured this little brave ant by the name of Flick. And Flick had to go into this large city to recruit some warriors for his ant village. It was being under attack by grasshoppers. So maybe it's my dark side, but one of my favorite scenes in that movie is when Flick comes up to this travel trailer that has a bug zapper hanging over the front door. And we see this little bug by the name of Harry kind of flying around that zapper, and he seems to be flying into it. And we hear Harry's friend trying to warn him, no, Harry, no, don't look at the light. But Harry, man, he's entranced. He just sucked right in. And as he flies right into that little zapper, you hear his famous last words. I can't help it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> See, you have a dark side too. <laughs> See, you, know, you like that. See, attractive things sometimes are dangerous. We get entranced by them. Our passions, they get filled up by these attractive things, and before we know it, we're toast. Because the enemy, he knows we have this weakness, and he knows how to exploit it. This is Palm Sunday. It's the last Sunday before Easter, which means it's our last talk in this series we've been doing called Total Devotion. In the series, we've been looking at the story of the temptation of Jesus. We've been analyzing the tactics that the enemy is using to bring down the Lord. And we've been exploring how those tactics, the enemy also uses them on us. And so we've been learning from Jesus. How do we respond to those attacks? How do we respond when the devil's in the middle of trying to take us out? Because we know that those attacks, they're aimed to rob us of our joy, joy that God wants to pour into our life this Easter and beyond. And so as we get into this last week of preparation for Easter, I want to focus on one more problem, one more tactic that the enemy uses, and it has to do with this problem of passion. How our passions can be blinded by attractive things so that we don't see the danger that lurks underneath. So let's turn then to the story that comes from Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We'll pick up the story as it begins in verse 8. And look inside your bulletins. I have notes there. You can follow along the notes. There's little blanks to keep you awake so you can fat fill them in. We pick up the story in verse 8. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. As Matthew has been leading us through this story, we have been steadily climbing. We started off, you remember, in the desert where the devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. Then we climbed higher. The devil took Jesus to the top of the temple, tempted him to jump down in order to test the Father's love. And now we climb higher still to the top of a mountain from which Jesus can see all the kingdoms of the world in all their splendor. It must have been some amazing vision, don't you think? And something entirely out of the ordinary. Because really there is no planet, or is no mountain on this planet anyway, from which you can stand on the top of it and see all the nations of the world. So, Clearly, something unusual is happening here. In fact, in the story of Luke, we see another version of that story. And Luke adds this other dimension that in an instant, he saw all these kingdoms of the world. So it was just in a brief moment of time. So imagine that, imagine that particular vision. It must have been overpowering. I mean, as I thought about it this week, I, I almost drove off the road because I was just thinking, you know? Imagine what it would look like to be on that mountain and see all the kingdoms of the world 
all at once, in all their splendor, in all their glory, in a single instant. Now that's a captivating vision. To average minds like your and mine, we'd probably be so encapsulated and entranced by that vision, we would just be drawn toward it. We'd be like Harry heading toward that light. It's just too beautiful, right? Which begs the question, why would the enemy put this vision in front of Jesus? Why would Jesus be attracted by this vision of all the people or all the kingdoms of the world? Why would Jesus see that as attractive? Well, I think it's more than just all the wealth and the power. I think it's more than all that. I mean, you and I, we'd see that vision. We'd say, wow, this is awesome. We'd be lost. But Jesus, I think it went deeper. I think the enemy was really tapping into his role as the Messiah, as the king, the future king. Because one of the promises that go all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through Scripture, is this promise that this king is going to inherit all the kingdoms of the world. That someday all the kingdoms in the world are going to kneel to the throne of David. In fact, let's look at one passage just so we see what I'm talking about here. Look at Psalm 2. It's right in your notes there. Here's one of those promises. It says, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. See, it was promised from the beginning that the king would one day rule over all the nations of the earth. It's appropriate, I think, that we talk about this vision today. It's Palm Sunday. It's that Sunday where Jesus rides into Jerusalem and the people rejoice and they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the streets. It's a little glimpse of what will one day happen in the future when the King of Kings comes back. And all his people and all the nations of the world will rejoice because God is here. And one wonders if as Jesus looked at all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor, if he might be tempted to want to see those promises fulfilled now more than later. Could it be that as he looked at all the kingdoms of the world, he just yearned for that promise to be fulfilled? See, I believe that at this point, Jesus knew that his suffering and his death lay ahead. He knew that the death was going to be important to God's work. But here's the enemy who wants to stop that work coming to Jesus and saying, Do you want it now? Could he be tempted to say, skip all that messy cross stuff? And take the kingdoms now. Grab the victory. Just go for the victory. Win now. Claim the prize. Skip all that messy stuff. Let's just get it over with. Do it now. I wonder, Jesus in his weakened physical condition, if he would listen to that message. And what's scary to me as I look at that story is how easily the devil knew the image that Jesus needed to see. Isn't it amazing how he knew exactly what would be attractive to Jesus, that vision of the kingdoms? He knew, or at least he thought he knew, what made Jesus tick. He knew the passions that consumed him, the passion for God's will and God's way. He knew. And he knew exactly what to dangle in front of Jesus' eyes at just that moment in his weakened physical condition that maybe, just maybe, he could catch the Son of God, off balance. One of the things that's scary to me about that is if the devil could do that to Jesus, can you imagine what he could do with us? I mean, compared to Jesus, we're probably like easy prey. <laughs> because, see, we don't have that deep burning passion for God's will and God's way that Jesus did. And the devil, devil was able to use that. We have other kind of passions. Now, sometimes they're good. Right? We have passions to see poverty abolished. We have passions for justice, passions, uh, passions for human rights. We have passions for our family, passions for our country, passions for our sports teams. Those are all good, right? <laughs> 
The problem with us, though, is we have other kind of passions. Passions that aren't so noble. Passions that, if we're just honest, they're all about us. How to gratify me now. Those are the passions that can get a hold of us too. Passions like greed and envy and lust and jealousy. Those passions can get inside of our soul and start eating us away. And the enemy knows we have those passions and he knows what to dangle in front of our eyes to go after them. He knows what is our particular weakness. If it's power or wealth or sex, he knows what item. If he dangles that in front of our eyes, he's got us. We get entranced. We're like the bug being drawn into the zapper. We just can't walk away. And we can be sure that whenever we are drawn like that into this attractive thing that the devil puts before us, we know that there's always a price to pay. And when he does it to Jesus, there's a powerful price to pay, a dangerous price to pay. Continuing the story, let's look at verse number nine. The devil says to Jesus, all this I will give you, all these kingdoms, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. How badly do you want all these kingdoms? How badly, Jesus, do you want these prophecies fulfilled? How badly do you want that prize now? See, the enemy is making an audacious attempt here. He's, he's trying to get the Son of God to abandon the Father and just take it now. It's a test. How much does he really want victory now? See, the enemy from the very beginning has been in this business of opposing God's will and God's way. God had a plan of how he wants to work the salvation to the world and involve Jesus coming, dying for us. But from the very beginning, he's been after that plan. He's been fighting against it. God somehow, for some reason, gives him this freedom to operate in this broken, fallen world, to attack us, to attack even his plan. This teaching, it kind of comes all the way through scriptures. I just want to highlight one particular passage. It comes from 1 John chapter 3. It's one aspect of this teaching. John says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Why? Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So this battle that Jesus now has with the enemy, this has been going on from the beginning. In fact, we saw it. You remember that story in the Garden of Eden where the devil comes to the woman with this attractive thing? <laughs> This fruit that would give her the knowledge as God had it, and she couldn't resist the attractive thing. She ate and gave her husband to eat. But as soon as they did it, the price that was demanded of them was absolute. They lost their innocence. They lost their innocence. They lost paradise. They lost our innocence for us. They lost our paradise. That going after the attractive thing, man, it held a price that was beyond calculation. And now the enemy was trying the exact same tactic with Jesus. He holds out this attractive thing, all the kingdoms of the world. You can have them now, Jesus, if you just skip all that messy cross stuff. You can have it now. You see how dangerous this was? This was a dramatic moment. Everything hinged. The stakes couldn't be higher. If Jesus didn't see through the devil's tactics, he would pay a price that would affect you and I for all of eternity. Jesus saw through. So what do we learn from that? Well, for one thing, it seems to me we have to admit that the devil never gives us anything for nothing. 
Those attractive things he dangles in front of us, they always cost us more than we want to pay. They will always cost us extreme, extreme measures. They will always ask for a piece of ourselves. Now, sometimes this cost is obvious, right? We've seen this happen. We, we've gone after some attractive thing, whatever it was, and we got ourselves in a mess. Uh, we had one more drink than we should have had. We slept with somebody we shouldn't have slept with. We went to some party we shouldn't have gone to. We told some story we shouldn't have told. We told some lie. We sent some email. All these things because we're attracted to something we wanted. And our passions, they confuse our judgment and we make a bad decision. Before we know it, we're paying unbelievable consequences. One of the hardest challenges I have sometimes is talk to young people and talk to them about their lifestyle and say, you don't understand. So you make one mistake and it has consequences that last for years in prison <laughs> or some other thing. These ball players, man, to make these bad decisions, next thing you know, they're on the news because they just couldn't get control of that passion and they had to pay a price that was far more than they would be willing to pay if they knew that this was the price. Sometimes, of course, the cost is not so obvious. Sometimes we think, ah, I'll just do this little thing here. I know God wouldn't like it, but you know what? It's just a bit of harmless fun. So we watch something we shouldn't watch, or we date somebody we shouldn't date, or we go to some party we shouldn't go to, and we think, you know what, it's just for fun. It, it, the cost here is minimal. I know God wouldn't like it, but the cost is minimal. It's just a bit of harmless fun. The problem with that is underneath it, we are paying a cost. We don't realize it, but we're paying a cost. Every time we make a decision like that, we're giving the enemy a little piece of ourselves. We're giving him a foothold. And here's the thing, we know, the story is clear. That's all the devil needs is a foothold. You remember the story of King David, a pious man. I mean, the scriptures call him a man after God's own heart. This is a man who wrote Psalms in the Bible. <laughs> You couldn't find a more holy person for his time. And yet all it took was one night looking over his banister at an attractive person, an attractive thing, and the devil just needled his way in there. And if you know the story, one thing led to another, and before he knew it, this pious man who believed passionately about God, he was now committing adultery. Then he committed murder to cover up the adultery. Then he had to lie to cover up the murder. He was a pious man, strong man. It just took that chasing after that attractive thing. It seemed like a harmless gla glance, not much of a price to pay. But in fact, he gave a part of himself. See, when the devil came to Jesus and said, worship me, he wasn't asking for a polite nod or some kind of formal worship. He was asking for surrender. He was asking Jesus to give up everything. And when he comes to us and he puts this attractive thing in front of you, what he's asking you behind that attractive thing, whether we realize it or not, what he is asking, will you worship me? We don't think of that. The temptation comes in our mind. We don't hear that question, but it's clear and it's explicit. Behind every temptation is the devil standing there saying, will you worship me? And none of us want to think of ourselves as devil worshipers, do we? Those are crazy people you read about in the papers, right? They're on CNN. We're not we're devil worshipers. So if we're not devil worshipers, why would we dare want to give our piece of ourselves to the enemy? Why would we want to give him a foothold? When what we know is that he will use that piece, he will use that foothold to destroy us, to destroy the work of God. 
like he did to Jesus, he will tempt us to abandon God, forfeit our mission, and submit our will to him. He was tempted, Jesus, will you become a client king, as Paul calls him, to the God of this world? Behind every temptation is the devil saying to us, will you worship me? Will you forget the Father and worship me? Powerful odds. Powerful stakes. So what do we do? How do we possibly combat this kind of power? See, we can get stuck in that place. We can be like Harry, man. I know I have this problem. I know I'm attracted to this dangerous light, but I can't break the spell. It just keeps calling me in. How do I get there? How do I find freedom? How do I get released from all this? Well, I think there's a clue in how Jesus responds to his temptation. Look what he says in verse 10. Jesus says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's the first time that Jesus, in this story, where Jesus comes right out and just calls the devil by name. He calls him Satan. And Satan means adversary, accuser. If I had to read between the lines here, I think Jesus is getting kind of ticked off about this whole thing. I think it's personal now. He's calling out the enemy. Call him by name. You're an accuser. You're an adversary. And he tells him, stand down. Away from me. I'm done with you. I think the devil stepped over a line when he dared to ask the Son of God to stop worshiping God and start worshiping him. I think that was it. The de- Jesus was done then. Even in his weak physical condition, he's like, this is over. Get away from me. An unqualified no. I'm not worshiping the devil. I worship the Lord our God and I serve him alone. And the battle is over. And if you read the rest of the text, that's when the angels come and minister to him. The battle is over when he sends the enemy away. He proclaims his worship. So we need to dig into that answer. If we really want the key, how are we going to fight these addictions? How are we going to fight these attractive things that have such a hold on us? Somehow it has to do something with this worship. And so let's look a little deeper. And as we've seen in all the other examples we've walked through this past series, Jesus is quoting from Deuteronomy. He's quoting from a speech that Moses gave as the children of Israel were about to go into this land. And so we have to dig a little bit and look at that story. It comes up in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I printed that in your text so you can see the story. And so Moses is saying... When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, And take your oaths in his name. See, this is where Jesus gets these words. He says, fear the Lord your God, serve him only. That's what Jesus is quoting. Well, kind of. Right? The clever ones among you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God. Moses says, fear the Lord your God. How many of you noticed that? I've got a couple. Give yourself a star. Awesome job. Why these difference in words? Well, remember, we're dealing with a bit of a language issue. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. That's what Moses was, that's the words of Moses. And the New Testament is primarily written in Greek. And Jesus spoke Aramaic, (laughs) which is a combination of Hebrew and other influences. And then, of course, on top of all that, we got to translate this stuff into English. (laughs) 
So there's a bit of a wandering journey here when it comes to language and picking the right word to translate what word. But what you need to understand is underneath, they're speaking the same truth. See, in the Hebrew world and in the New Testament Greek world, worship and fear always kind of went together. See, fear is this holy kind of fear, this deep, deep reverence for God. It's the kind of fear that makes you realize a holy God is, I'm standing in his presence. How would you feel if you walked into the presence of a holy God? See, that's the feeling that we're talking about. And that part is all part of worship that's wrapped together. So Jesus and Moses, they're on the same page here, even if our English translation has a slightly different word. Let's look even deeper. Let's look at that picture. That picture that Moses is painting of a people that were about to go into a land filled with attractive things. He says it there. You're going to go into this land and you're going to find a lot of awesome things. You're going to find a big land filled with flourishing cities. You're going to walk right into the cities. You're going to take over. They're going to have all this stuff done for you. You're going to take these houses that have all these beautiful things in them, and you didn't provide those things. You're going to go in, and you're going to find wells that somebody else spent all those hot days digging. You're going to find olive groves and vineyards filled with plants you never planted. And Moses had a fear that they're going to go into this land filled with attractive things, and they're going to forget the God who brought them there. They're going to forget the God that freed them from slavery and captivity. They're going to forget the God that provided all these things to them. And it's in that context that he reminds them, worship God alone. Worship the Lord alone. Serve him only. What do you think about when you hear that word worship? I'm afraid that in our culture, one of the reasons we don't get some of these truths and we don't participate in the power is because we've watered down the definition of worship. Not only in our culture, I think in our church culture, even in our evangelical culture, we've watered down what it means to worship God. We think maybe of this service where we worship God. We think of maybe the sermon or even especially the music, right? We think of worship music. So worship is all about singing. In fact, once in a while, someone will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I just couldn't worship today. The, the music, it was just... And because I'm a pastor, I listen very patiently. But in my heart, I'm thinking, so what definition of worship are they using? Because the biblical definition of worship is so much broader than deeper than how I feel about the way I sing. No, the biblical definition of worship is broad and deep. And Moses wants to be very clear to the people of Israel, when you go into this land filled with attractive things, you better have a grasp on what it means to worship. Because otherwise you'll get in that land and those attractive things will start to lure you in a bad place. And it will destroy you. So going in, understand what it means to worship God. And he gives them, I think, two perspectives on this worship that I'd like to share with you today. And they come from this same speech from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It goes back a little earlier in the verses to verse 1, and I have that in your notes. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey. Remember that word, be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So you go into this land flowing with good things, attractive things, and the first thing you need to know is you need to obey. Worship is obedience. Worship is obedience. The first basic principle worship is to obey. Why is that? Why is that? God gave worship to us as a gift. Obedience is the pathway 
through which you can navigate all this danger that's out there in the world. I know it's hard sometimes. I, I talk to fo young folks all the time, young couples, and by the way, I talk to old fools all the time too. <laughs> and they, they've sunk into the, some of this stuff. Sometimes I talk to the old fool in the mirror and I try to explain that to him. <laughs> These laws that God gives us, they're for our benefit and our protection, kind of like the rules you lay down for your kids. They're to keep us out of harm's way. If we're going to survive in a world filled with attractive things and not let those attractive things kill us, we're going to have to follow God's path. We're going to have to do His stuff. That's His provision. Worship is God's gift to us. And that obedience is part of how we're going to get through. But what happens if we've got that already? What happens if we know, you know, I know God's commands, they're for my benefit. I know they're to benefit. I just can't help it, man. The light is so beautiful. <laughs> I just, I know I shouldn't fly in there. I know it's a bug zapper, but I can't help myself. Well, there's another aspect of worship that Moses wants us to get. And he picks that up in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And here it is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Worship is obedience, but worship is also love. Worship is the way that we show our love to God. And here's what he wants. He wants all of us. All of us. All of us. Nothing held back. All our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, everything he wants. Jesus quotes this as the great command. God has to be the obsession that we have. God has to be the focus. Worshiping him has to be our focus. See, sometimes the problem is when we go into these challenging environments and these other things tempt us and try to take us off our game, we just kind of will it away. We say, I'm, I'm going to res resist. I'm going to resist. I'm going to resist. I can resist. <clears throat> and we can't. Well, here's the good news. God got that, which is why he wants to put a new passion in your soul. He wants to put a passion in your soul that's more powerful than any passion the devil can put in your soul. He wants to give you a passion for him. He wants to give you a vision of yourself. For yourself. He wants to give a vision of himself so he can motivate you and empower you. You remember what it's like when you were out there playing the field and then you found the one, man, and the vision of that person, man, they kept you on the straight and narrow because you're in love with this one. Multiply that by about a thousand fold. That's what God wants to put into your soul. He wants you to see a vision of him that is so overpowering that that love starts to kick in. In fact, I would take this to a whole practical level. When you get in those places, and I've done this, it's a practical tool that I use. I use it more often than I like to admit. When I get into those tempting situations, where the devil's attracting me, I start worshiping God. <laughs> Literally. I want to fill my mind up with God at those moments. I get up and I walk away. And I start praising God with Scripture. I put the vision of God in front of me at those moments. Because I'm not just walking away and trying to exert my willpower. I'm trying to fill myself up with a new vision and a new joy. Sometimes you have to do it quietly. People think you're nuts. Just stand up in a party and start talking out loud. But get up. You can go to the restroom. You can walk outside. You're sitting in your living room and you're minding your own business and something comes up. Get up and walk out and say, you know what, God, I need to fill you up. I need to fill my mind up with you right now. Take the step. It works. I'm telling you. I'm speaking from my own experience. Get up. Walk out. Fill your mind with God. See, worship is God's provision to fill us up. 
That's why he said to the people, he said, listen, when you go into this land with attractive things, I want you to take one day a week. Stop whatever you're doing. Everybody get together and you just fill your mind with God for that day. Because all week there's these attractive things trying to get your attention. Come together. That's what we're trying to do here. That's why we come together every Sunday. It's not deaf worship all by itself. It's just this attempt to say, we've got to fill you up with God one more time. Because that's God's answer to fighting the passions out there. So let me ask you today. What are those attractive things that are drawing you in like a bug to the zapper? What is it in your life? What are those things that the devil knows how to play you with? What are those passions you just can't get under control? Is it jealousy? Is it rage? Is it greed? Is it lust? What is it that the devil knows how to play? What are those things he's dangling in front of your eyes right now where you're saying, ah, I just, I can't help it. I keep going into the light and I know it's going to hurt me and I got to stop. Is it wealth? Is it power? Is it sex? What is that for you? Here's what I want you to hear today. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil in you and in this world. He wants to destroy the power that that stuff has over you. He came to destroy that. And he wants to fill you up with himself, with his spirit. He wants to give you a vision of God that was more powerful than any other vision you might have right now. He wants to give you a passion for God that's bigger than all that. That's why he came, to deliver you from this curse. But it starts with this decision that says, you know what? I'm done. I want to love God. I want to obey God. I'm tired of worshiping the devil. I'm tired of getting in his bandwagon. I'm tired of giving him a piece of myself. I want to give myself to God. Completely, totally, no hearts back. No hold back. Now I realize it's not always that simple. Some of you know that. You've tried that. That's why it's a process sometimes. That's why we have community here. Sometimes you need to do it with others. That's why at Bethany we have a lot of groups that are there just to help you fight that stuff off and be filled up by God. We have first place for health. Maybe it's the food thing that, God, that the enemy can use. So we have first place for health. Awesome program where they try to fill you up with God instead of food. <laughs> we have Celebrate Recovery. It's for anybody with a hurt, habit, a hang-up. We go in there. I'm a part of that group. When I can get there, we go in and we, every time, we're about how can we fill ourselves with, up with God. We list things out. You say take an inventory. Write down those things that are bugging you. Write those things that have a hold on you. God wants to get over that. We, we want to come alongside you in that ministry. We have Stephen ministers that will walk alongside you and encourage you that you can talk to. It's confidential. We have for men only, for you guys that are struggling with pornography, man. You just can't break the spell. We have that. We have Changes to Heal that meets on Monday nights. Awesome, awesome Bible study intended with how God can empower you to break that stuff that has you chained. And all the time we're trying to give you classes to fill you up with God. On Tuesdays we have men's studies, women's studies, senior studies, young adult studies called Lift, man. We have all these times, they're just, and I probably forgot some, so nobody get mad at me. Divorce care, Divorce care. thank you. See, I knew. I knew I'd forget something. That's what happens when you get old. Uh, all these ministries that are out there, they're to encourage you. You don't have to stay a slave anymore. That's why we do what we do here. See, underneath it all, we all have to learn to say what Jesus said. It's what the Israelites should have said when they were wandering through the desert and saw all these attractive things. They should have said, away from me, Satan. I'm only worshiping God here. Me and my house, we're only worshiping God. So my challenge to you is, can you learn to say that? Can we learn to say that together? 
get out of my house, Satan. Just beat it. I'm not worshiping you, not for a minute, not for a day. My heart, my life, it belongs to God Almighty. The enemy just wants to destroy. God wants to build up and give you hope and a future and a destiny. Give me a vision of God that fills me up so I don't need this other crappy visions out there destroying me. Let's pray. Father, it's a powerful truth that your worship can fill us up. The vision of you can fill us up. They can overpower us and take us in our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. It can fill us up and it can encourage us to obey your commands. That's the way we want to worship you with all of ourself, all of our obedience, all of our total devotion. That's the name of the whole series. That's what this is all about. We want to be totally devoted to you and you alone. So Father, help us with those areas in our life where we need to give victory. We're tired, of, we're tired of selling a piece of ourselves to the devil. We don't want to worship him anymore. We only want to worship you. Accept this as our prayer and our desire and our new passion. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.